A small Catholic school in Kenya is seeking to change the lives of AIDS orphans through educational opportunities that could literally save their lives. We've got a real James 1 verse 27 story going on here tonight, so please stay with us. Thank you. Thank you and welcome. I'm Father Mitch Packle and welcome to EWTN Live, where we bring you guests from all over the world. And we got one coming here from a great distance tonight. But first, I want to mention that today is the feast of St. John of the Cross. He was born in 1542. And as a young priest, I think only 27 years old, he met the considerably older St. Teresa of Avila. And in that encounter, he caught her spirit of reform. She'd been a Carmelite nun for a while and began a reform of her order to get back to what they're supposed to do. During the days of the bubonic plague, they had eased up their rules and things got a little crazy. He worked with her to help bring about a reform also for the men's communities that had done the same thing in giving a strict observance of the Carmelite rule. And their work together flourished, not only in terms of transforming their communities, but also their own lives and the great holiness that they achieved through a lot of suffering on both hands. Well, both of them suffered quite a bit oftentimes at the hands of other people in the church and their own communities. Uh, they remain. Uh, so they, they grew in great holiness, and we still treat St. John of the Cross's literature as great classics of spirituality. We urge you to take a look at some of that. All right, now we'll go to our guest. He is a Jesuit priest. And a friend of mine, since I entered, he was, uh, entered the novitiate a couple years before I did, but I've known him since I was a novice, 48 years ago. And he's the chaplain of St. Aloysius Gonzaga Catholic High School in Nairobi, Kenya. It's a unique school whose parental involvement is, in many cases, non-existent because every student has lost one or even both parents to HIV AIDS. So please welcome one of my favorite African Americans, Father Terry Charlton. Father, Great. <laughs> Good to be with you, Father you, Mitch. You sort of reverse the African American tendency. You're an American who's gone to Africa. Correct. How long have you been there? I've been in Africa actually 29 years now. Yes. I started out in Kumasi, Ghana, so in West Africa, right. working at a spirituality center that was mm -hmm. in early 88 and then mid-year um, 1990. I was asked to move over to East Africa to Nairobi, Kenya, where I've been living and working ever since. In the span of territory between West Africa, Ghana, which is coastal, mm -hmm. to East Africa and Kenya, is not, there's a coastal region of Kenya. That's still a good distance. That's yes, it's, it's bigger than the distance across the United States, across exactly. the continental uh, 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 United States. I mention that because a lot of folks don't realize how enormous Africa is and how absolutely diverse it That's is. Correct. We tend to think of Africa as monolithic, but it, it, it's not. It's a very diverse set of cultures, uh, national groups, and different eth ethnicities. We correct. think of them as color the same, but that's not true either. It's just very diverse. That's correct. And um, Kenya is, uh, uh, like most of Africa, has, 
kind of an artificial set of borders uh, imposed by European colonies, but is actually composed itself of diverse tribes. That's correct. There are about 40 different tribes in Kenya, um, some of them, of course, over the borders into other surrounding countries. Right. Um, the, there, there's been a fair amount of work now over um, some 50 years um, since independence to really bring the country together. But there's, mm -hmm. there remains some, some ethnic issues. But sure. one thing that we can um, really praise Kenya for is that it's, it's been quite peaceful. Like it's never been a tor really torn apart by war after independence, as is the case with so many African countries. And um, over the course of the last 20 plus years, there has been a good tradition set of multi-party democracy. And so the, the traditions are becoming strong and well-established. And that's, yeah. a, that's a great help for any country um, to, move, to be able to move forward in a democratic way. And, you know, religiously, uh, Kenya has also diversity. That's correct. Uh, among the, the traditional religions are not all the same among themselves, are well, they? Well, uh, traditional religion, there's, there's a, a lot of connection in traditional religion. Mm -hmm. um, belief in one God, one supreme being, but that God is understood generally as being very, very distant, kind of far off. So. Mm -hmm. Um, what is really paid attention to is a lot of spirits and mm -hmm. then ancestors. Mm -hmm. Okay, and that'll ring itself out in different ways among different tribes, but that's generally what traditional religion in Africa is about. But there's also a significant, not, not enormous, but a, a, a bit of a Muslim that's population. That's right. The, the Muslim population would be somewhere around 10%. Mm -hmm. um, and then... Um, Certainly, over half the population is Christian, mm -hmm. okay, and then about a quarter of the population is Catholic, mm -hmm. okay. Now, that's that's probably what you would get from an almanac, okay. In fact, um, you would talk to many people that would be unchurched in Kenya, and they will say, if you ask them what's your religion, they will say Christian, okay, because they have some kind of belief in, in God and in Jesus as Savior, but it, it, it's rather vague. But right. Jesus is significant enough to them, even though 10, 15, 20 percent, maybe largely unchurched, that they would, they would self-identify as, as Christians. Mm -hmm. so, so Christianity really does dominate um, the religious ethos of the country at mm -hmm. this point in time. And, you know, uh, well, and that's, again, very different than other countries. Nigeria mm -hmm. would have a much larger Muslim that's population, mm -hmm. and uh, Tanzania would as well, and so, and Sudan, all, all mm -hmm. these different countries vary. And again, it's important for folks in the West mm -hmm. to understand the richness uh, of Africa and its language and culture. But there is also a difficulty, uh, and that is uh, coming with the spread of AIDS. Mm -hmm. I'm, illness uh, mm -hmm. and, and plague have been, you know, through human existence. That's, that's sure. been something uh, It affects animals, it affects human beings. This is, uh, uh, even animals get the flu and uh, other problems. Um, how long has the AIDS crisis been affecting Africa and how bad is it? Okay, well it does vary in how badly um, Africa is affected in different parts. So okay. it's worst in Southern Africa than Eastern Africa where Kenya is, mm -hmm. would kind of be the second worst level area. And then East Africa generally is not, sorry, West Africa is generally not so bad. Okay. okay. All right, so we'd, we'd be talking about um, since the 80s, increasing into the 90s and so forth, kind of growing difficulties, okay? Now, <clears throat> fortunately, because of the availability of antiretroviral drugs in a widespread way, and this is largely through the support of governments in the West, including the United States, helping make these um, drugs 
which um, relieve the symptoms of HIV and enable people to live a fairly normal life. Um, because of that, that availability um, in a widespread way for low cost or in most cases free, um, really the pandemic is abating, even though Great. many people still remain infected, um, that they're not showing the symptoms, they're able to have a more normal life, um, a, a much better life expectancy. And, and so, so things really are improving in that way. Also, uh, the, mm -hmm. the use of the, these drugs, um, uh, antiretroviral uh, drugs, helps prevent the spread that's, that's as correct. well. The, the, the people who are infected who are using these drugs tend to, to spread it less. Yes. If, it's if not they, 100%. If, but if they become involved in risky behavior, they're much, like, much less likely to infect someone else. Mm -hmm. okay? And it's also the case that um, mother-to-child infection just should not happen. It does still happen. But if the mother is known to be HIV positive um, as she's moving toward giving birth, it can be taken care of um, such that the, the child should never be born infected with, H, with the HIV right. virus. So, 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 so a, lot, a, big a lot is being done um, positively mm -hmm. in terms of living with AIDS and in terms of lessening the spread of AIDS. Yeah. Um, it, it still is very present and very much affects us. To, to just maybe say a little bit about the origin of St. Aloysius, um, when I came to Kenya, one of the jobs in addition to my main job, which was teaching theology to young Jesuits preparing for the priesthood from all around Africa, they came to our theology seminary in Nairobi, um, I was asked to become chaplain of a Catholic lay group that follows Jesuit spirituality called Christian Life Community. So that was in 1990, and it was just getting started in Kenya at that point. Um, this group, it loosely, you might say it's something of a third order of right. the Jesuits, um, lay people who are following Jesuit spirituality, very much trying to support the kind of work that Jesuits are are doing um, so well some, themselves though remaining in the lay that's state right, that's that's right very very definitely um, so some members of Christian life community as their apostolate um, in the year 2001 decided to reach out to people who were living with AIDS in what is arguably the largest slum in sub-saharan Africa an area of Nairobi called Kibera and it's um, maybe half a million people. So they just decided to visit some people who at that time were living with AIDS, um, a kind of ministry of presence. This was a time when most Kenyans did not really understand um, what HIV AIDS was about. The disease was called slim because People who had progressed with AIDS became very thin and had a kind of look that you could say, these people are suffering from the same thing. But people thought, is it witchcraft? Um, if I get near these people, will they give me the evil eye and I will get what they have? Mm -hmm. Well, our members of Christian Life community, of course, appreciated how one contracted um, HIV virus. And so they said, these people are very much ostracized. We want to reach out to them and just be present to them, and so and, and just so mm -hmm. so folks understand mm -hmm. when you say that this is a slum, we're showing a few photographs mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. the Kibera slum. Mm -hmm. um, what do people do for a living oh. in the slum? Okay, well, how do they? What, what's going on? Okay, so many of the men living in Kibera will go into Nairobi, into the industrial area or downtown area. Um, to look for day labor, okay? okay? So they will walk five to seven miles in the hope that they will get labor, mm -hmm. okay? And then if they do, that gives them some money to come back, support themselves. And then 
there would be um, various kinds of services. Like I've seen a woman sit behind a table about this size and sell a few tomatoes, um, maybe a bit of kale, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And that's how she supports her family. Um, yeah. it's, it's really amazing. Um, they talk about um, um, Juakali labor, okay? Juakali means under the fierce sun. So these are, these are people who are doing small crafts and that sort of thing to support themselves. So it's kind of the in, informal sector of society. Those would be the ways that people in Kibera are um, getting by. Yeah, and it's barely getting by. That's, so that's right. Average, you know, annual income would be just a really a few uh, between, dollars. Yeah, less than less than two dollars a day for, yeah. for per capita. Would, yeah. So they're really living in devastating poverty. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, so you're yeah. talking about an annual income of about seven hundred dollars, exactly. maybe. Exactly. Exactly. And and people are not doing well to begin with, mm -hmm. uh, and that certainly would make the, the systems, the, the physical system, more susceptible to diseases mm -hmm. of all kinds, mm -hmm. but also weakened yeah. with uh, yeah. for HIV. Yeah. So then, at this at this time, um, there were no antiretroviral drugs available to the poor, so these people expected that they would be dying within a few years. Mm -hmm. um, so the members of Christian Life Community, as they supported them, accompanied them, visited them, were listening to their concerns. And the concern that kept coming up, understandably, was the future of their children. Mm -hmm. um, well, so, mm -hmm. and so folks understand, mm -hmm. you know, when um, you know, somebody has AIDS, they may have children who usually do not have HIV. But sometimes, too. Yes, yes. So there, there certainly can be mother-to-child um, transmission. Um, so often in a family, you'll find older children who are not infected. Okay, we use the term affected because they're living in a family that um, is suffering, where there's, the parents, often enough, are suffering from the virus um, at this time before the availability mm -hmm. of antiretroviral dr viral drugs we're not able, we're not able to work, we're unhealthy, that sort of thing. So they were sinking more and more deeply into poverty, okay? Um, at that time, children who were born HIV positive, um, they would either not live long or they would not be very healthy. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of sickness, that sort of True. thing. So they would tend not to do well in school. Okay. Yeah, and, so. and just again to put mm. what you said in context, these are folks who may be making $700 a year, and when they get it sick, then they become even more poor. That's right. You That's know, right. so not even enough to eat yes. uh, and live on. Okay. So, so this is this is devastating yes. kind of poverty. It, it, it really is. So um, our, our situation at the time in Kenya is that... Um, there's no free secondary education, no free high school education. So, How about elementary school? Well, we, we just were moving into this around 2002, 2003. Mm -hmm. um, but people care so much about their children that they would put them, that they would pay a small amount in order to have them do primary education. But high school education was just beyond the means yeah. of these people. Yeah. So. So that became their concern, their future, the future of their children, which they saw as education, the next stage being high school, which these families just could not access. So um, our people began talking about seeing what they could do about this. One thing led to another. And so in December of 2003, this group came to me um, as the national chaplain of Christian Life Community in Kenya. And I think knowing being an American that I might have some friends or some fundraising potential, that sort of thing. And said, they said to me, we think we need to start a school for the children of these people, that um, we can really do something to make such a difference in their lives. And 
it was just one of those moments that as I heard that, I just paused and reflected. And my response was, I don't know if we can succeed or not, but there's so much potential for good that we've got to try. Yeah. Okay, and I, and you know, I really was, there really was um, prayerful reflection involved there, but it came so spontaneously that, that I, I had a certain confidence that this was from God, it was gonna have to be te tested by seeing if we could move forward with this. And then just in amazing ways, we were able to move forward. In a month, um, we had the school up and running. Um, and so some basic money came forward. We had to hire teachers. Um, we had to find a place to have the school. Very basic conditions, mud walls, dirt floors, right in the middle of Kibera. Um, we had to get desks made in this um, informal Juakali sector, that sort of thing. So what we did is we started with a small sophomore class of 21 students, and then we accepted a larger, kind of a full classroom size class of freshmen of 35 students. And okay. And we move forward through that year. Mm -hmm. one, one of the things, too, that I, I think will be helpful, and this is where mm -hmm. James 1.27 comes into play, is that a lot of times families would, would take in orphans. Mm -hmm. The extended family would take mm -hmm. in orphans or children. Mm -hmm. But AIDS orphans were oftentimes feared by the extended family. Is that the case in Kenya? Um, Really, no, we, we did not have much problem with that way. So um, as, as time would go on with the school, um, most of our, most of our um, students had lost both of their parents. The majority had lost both of their parents. Mm -hmm. The minority would be staying with one surviving parent. Um, but in most cases, these children were taken in by an older brother or sister okay. or an aunt or an uncle now, in many cases, these people would have their own, their own families. So right. they were, they're living in Kibera, so they're, they're really taking poor. on the, board, the, the burden, um, struggling themselves with their own families of another, another okay. youngster. Now, and James 1.27, I just want to point out, uh, says that relig religion that God our fathers accepts as pure and faultless is this to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And this is something where, you know, we have a lot, there's all kinds of elements of the general culture that would be a pollution. There's, there's a lot of, uh, in, in, not only in the West, it's gone to Africa and Asia, th this materialistic uh, culture that sees large amounts of acquisition mm -hmm. and, you know, oftentimes wasteful spending on self for luxury items while widows and orphans are in great, great need. Mm -hmm. This is uh, something that, uh, and of course, once people give in to all kinds of materialism and lose any sense of self-denial, what you replace self-denial with is self-absorption. Mm -hmm. And that's the pollution that uh, James would be talking about, whereas taking care of widows and orphans is part of religion. And the freedom of religion includes being able to serve people in these ways. You're right. I, I definitely agree with that. And certainly in Christian Life Community Kenya, deciding to, to reach out this way, put a lot of time, resources into this, mm -hmm. um, starting this school. Um, you know, it certainly was saying, we, we want to, to reach out to some of the people most in need in our society. And mm -hmm. of course, at the same time, we realized that we simply did not have the resources ourselves to do the kind of school that we wanted to do, a school that would be very much in the tradition of Jesuit schools, that would be a school that was preparing young people 
to really have a good and productive future, um, a school that is going to train a young person, form a young person, educate a young person holistically. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's not just about about reading, passing, writing, right, and math. Uh, yeah, passing go government exams. Um, it's it's very much about educating the whole person. Um, so the other side of that that has been essential to our progress um, at St. Aloysius is the fundraising that we've needed to do in the United States. And I've just been amazed at the, at the generosity of people. Um, our, our current budget, because we, we quickly realized that if, if we're really gonna make a long lasting difference in the life of these kids, that we could not say goodbye to them when they finish high school that we need to support them also for their college education. So we have been doing that. So presently our budget is about three quarters of a million dollars per year. Currently mm -hmm. we're accepting 35 boys and 35 girls on scholarship as freshmen in high school, seeing them through the four years of high school. Then there's a gap period um, like in England, some people may be familiar with this between when they finish high school and go to university. We have the same thing in Kenya. So actually the, a program that we have put in at that point is six months of community service where our now high school graduates give back something to society for what they have received. But it's also very much a transforming experience. The school motto that we came up right at the beginning of the school is to learn, to love, and to serve. Mm -hmm. It's actually based in um, a saying of Saint Ignatius um, that's very well known in all things to love and to serve. Mm -hmm. that, that's kind of what we need to be about, okay? Mm -hmm. So we added the, the learn, so to learn, to love, and to serve. And so that has really been important. The, the students know this, they buy into it, and really uh, an important moment to exercise that is during this six months of community service. They work Monday through Thursday in a placement we organize, and then on Friday they come back to the school for reflection groups. Um, and then we move them on um, and help them with their university studies in an area that each one is interested in. And, and many of them um, will go in a socia 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 socially oriented direction. So many become teachers themselves, um, social workers, community organizers, that sort of thing. But we certainly have people that say, well, I want to be a good businessman, but they, they take that on thinking in terms of, well, I want to help society move forward or I want to um, help provide a product that's going to benefit society, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So we really do feel that our, our students are taking on this perspective of really being for others in it, the way they live their lives. So that it, it's not just going to be acquiring an education and then getting out of Kibera and, and saying goodbye never seen again. It's you know, passing the education on and other skills that they have for the, the neighbors who also are very poor. That's right. Um, um, we have to take a break. Okay. We'll come back in a couple of minutes. But if you want to learn more about St. Aloysius Gonzaga School for AIDS Orphans in Nairobi, Kenya, please go to sagnairobi.org. sagnairobi.org. We'll be back in a couple of minutes to continue talking to Father Terry, so please stay with us.
Thank you and welcome back. We are with Father Terry Charlton, a fellow Jesuit. He's also the founder and chaplain of St. Aloysius Gonzaga Catholic High School for AIDS Orphans in Nairobi, Kenya. And first of all, why did you choose St. Aloysius Gonzaga as the patron of your school? Well, as you probably know, um, St. Aloysius, um, along with Maria Gretti, um, is one of the universal patrons for youth. Um, mm -hmm in the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, he died at the age of, of 23. Mm -hmm. um, he was from a noble family. His uncle was the Pope? Maybe. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> okay, his something like that. His mother's uncle, I think it was a great yeah. uncle, his mother's yeah. uncle was the Pope. Okay. Okay. He wanted to make him yeah. a cardinal, do something nice That's for right. my kid. That's yeah. right, so, so, um, so he really, he renounced his inheritance to join the Jesuits and he was studying in Rome, um, moving toward priesthood, and um, the plague broke out, and he said, I've got to serve um, the poor. He got sick and so could not work, recovered and said, I've got to go back and serve these victims of the plague. His superiors finally relented, um, and, then, and then he got, he got sick again and died. Okay, so he was very much a a martyr to this service of plague victims. There's, there's real question, did he die from the plague himself directly? In mm -hmm. other words, was he himself a victim of the plague contracting it, or was it more exhaustus, exhausted? Right. Right. Anyway, but that, either that, way, that's either beside, way, in the service the of point. plague exactly. victims. Okay. So, so number one then, and we additionally see him as, as a real example to our students, okay, who are studying, okay, but can't neglect to recognize they've got to still live lives that reach beyond themselves, okay? Mm -hmm. For a lot of that, in their lives as students, it's about caring for one another, mm -hmm. okay? But you've got to think beyond yourself, okay? I was mentioning the period of community service, okay, that's a real opportunity to take a little time off studying as um, Aloysius did and really be there for people in need. Okay, so that's one thing. And then um, in a secondary way, Aloysius is looked upon as a patron of people living with, suffering with, people affected by AIDS, kind of thinking that of that analogously as like a modern plague that, mm -hmm. because it is a pandemic that affects so many exactly. people. Exactly. Exactly, yes. and this is something, and you know, the, you're talking about how the students will oftentimes go on for more education to become teachers. Mm -hmm. They go and do community organizing, mm -hmm. helping to bring people together. They organize them for parenting classes mm -hmm. yeah. and, uh, you know, job training, things community, like that. Community cleanup, um, even things like organizing youth from the slum of Kibera um, for soccer teams, okay? But then before they go out for the game, okay, um, the, the organizers sit them down and give them some information about HIV. Um, okay. About, so they do the health training yes. and... It, so so it's, uh, and that would the organization be... is very much about bringing people together to, um, to find ways for a better life. Some of that's education, some of that's working together. Um, sometimes Play. It's, it's a group of, yeah, and, and even sometimes it's like a group of women coming together and setting up some little craft organization where they make goods together and sell those. Yeah. Things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, I uh, want to hear a little bit from some of the students at St. Aloysius. Uh, they call it St. Al's, right? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Uh, and uh, let's take a look at how this has affected their lives. I want to show you a little clip. Even if we are from the grounds, that is, we, are, we might be um, rejected in the society. We can be people in the future through this secondary education that we are getting in St. Aloysius High School. Today, here I am, probably like 15 years after the death of my parents. They are guiding me. If this goes wrong, they'll always be guiding me. I think they're watching down and ensuring that the person they left down is never suffering. 
So they bring good things in my life, like St. Aloysius. I feel we are just like a family in our class, or in our school, actually. All of us have very good future ambitions, and we are optimistic that with the help we are being accorded, this dream will be a reality one day. In fact, they have started becoming a reality for the past graduates of this school. Some of us want to be doctors, lawyers, pilots. Our students are motivated, and what mostly motivates them is the future. The, their future prospects, which they feel that without education, which they get in Santa Rosa then, their future is doomed. So most of them are anxious to make their future better than the way it is now. One of the things that this brings out, you know, when they talk about a future that you know, is made possible by this kind of education, an academic education, this brings out how Nairobi is a very modern uh, capital. This is this is not, you know, trying to look how, learn how to milk cows or you know hunt lions. I mean, it, sometimes people have movie versions of Africa from back in previous times. The, Nairobi is a vibrant, modern city, and people need modern skills. Is That's that correct. not correct? That's correct. Very definitely. Just, just one thing that hardly anyone would know is that um, Nairobi is, has the third highest number of United Nations workers of any city in the world after New York and after Geneva. Uh -huh. So it really is a very cosmopolitan regional capital. Um, and so, um, you know, we really are trying to educate young people who are going to make a, a difference for Kenya and even beyond. Yeah, and, and certainly, you know, Kenya, as you said, it has a real stability about it. That's um, correct. I think that their own independence from colonial days went much more smoothly than, some, than say, the Congo. Mm, sure. Uh, you know, Congo was a very difficult and remains difficult mm -hmm. and violent. And, but nearby, it's not only Congo, uh, not that far away mm -hmm. from Kenya, but also Somalia, Sudan. They're very difficult and dangerous places nearby where, and that's why United Nations is there. How do you help not only Kenya, but beyond Kenya to the rest of Africa sure. in crisis? Very true, very true. Um, yes. Um, I suppose we, we've become more conscious in the United States of what a dangerous world that, um, that we live in. Mm -hmm. But I think we're very aware in Kenya that we're part of a global world and, and we do have to be peacemakers. We do have mm -hmm. to be peacemakers in the way we live our lives and certainly the way we look beyond to the larger reality. That it's important that Kenya be a player for peace. And, you know, to give one important example of that, Kenyan soldiers are UN peacekeepers in Somalia, and those who do not want stability in Somalia have, have tried to foment terrorist activities in Kenya, okay? And so, fortunately, although there have been a few incidents that have been in the news a few years back, fortunately, the, our government has, in Kenya is really providing excellent security. And so, you know, people often ask me, well, you know, do you feel insecure? Do you worry as you walk around Nairobi? And no, no more than I, I walk around, when I walk around Chicago or some of our no big more. cities here in the United States. No more. States. <laughs> I would imagine so, that Nairobi is much safer than Chicago. There, there's, because there's a great deal of attention to security. So for example, your car is checked when you go into a shopping center and when you enter the mall itself, you know, you're, you're checked with a, mm -hmm. with a wand or that sort of thing mm -hmm. to, to make sure. So, so really security is a, a priority and, you know, I do feel very secure. I mean, yeah. it's, you know, like, like any big city in the United States, <laughs> there are places I wouldn't go at night and there were places I wouldn't go at all. But in fact, Kivera is not one of those places. I feel very safe 
well, in Kibera, yeah. at least during the day, yeah. moving around. And, and it, it's uh, something to uh, for folks to understand. I, I used to get similar questions when uh, when I was taking groups over to Israel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't you feel in danger? That actually, it's safer there than it is in one of our big cities. Mm -hmm. You know, Detroit or Chicago, especially Chicago right mm -hmm. now. It's a, a, a nadir of safety. Sure. Um, you know, this is not the case. And th there's not that the, the kind of tension and, and I don't sense the violent tension among Kenyans that we might see here or in places like Congo. Congo is a different sure. culture sure. Uh, with a lot of no. very politicized factions or some of the diamond uh, producing countries had tremendous difficulty because no. of various thieves who were using yeah. youth. And, and in so much of Africa that I'm that, that I'm familiar with. Um, you've mentioned Congo. I've spent a bit of time in, in South Sudan in particular where there's a lot of difficulty going on. Uh, you know, it's what's, what's so sad about so many of these conflicts that it's at the level of the politicians that have their, mm -hmm. own, their own armies, but the common people, they don't want this. No. Um, and, and they're not a part of it, except often to be victims or you know, to have relatives, friends um, who are maimed or killed. It's, it's very sad, it, it, um, this it, sort of thing. It's been a, for a long time in Africa that when there is starvation, mm -hmm. it's almost always caused by politicians interrupting the distribution of food That's correct. rather than by the lack of food. That's but, correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, this is the world for which you're preparing your students, a world of great modernity in Nairobi. Uh, and they, they need computer expertise and, and skills in law and medicine and other areas. And they're also coming, in, they're coming of age in uh, a continent of uh, which they have an important role as Kenyans to help bring peace and stability and prosperity to others. Um, let, the students themselves then are, are being changed with the, that, that. I was impressed with their faces mm -hmm. as they look forward to the future. I want to show another clip, sure. if we may, uh, about how uh, the, the students you know, feel about the way their futures changed at the school. After finishing my primary education, I didn't have any hopes. But St. Aloysius has raised my hopes of becoming a person in the future through giving me high school education. That is probably after passing through this system of education and I do well, probably I'll go to the university or to a college such that I'll, I'll sustain myself in the future. If not for St. Al's, I could not have had the chance to, to get high school education. And uh, that would mean that I would only be maybe a primary school dropout or stuff like that. But now, here I am, uh, I have, I'm going through my secondary school education and I'm assured that if I work hard and pass my exams, then I can go ahead for, for maybe, I could go to the university or maybe college. So, St. Al's is great. When, one of the things that folks notice is that they, uh, the, the, the students had a Swahili English uh, vocabulary book what language do they grow up speaking at home? Most of them will grow up speaking a, a local tribal language. Okay. okay. So then when they go to school the first couple of years, the language of ed the education is Swahili. And that would be in Nairobi, spoken a lot on the streets. Okay. Because Swahili is an international language yeah. in Africa, very especially much, East Very Africa. much a regional language throughout Africa throughout, pretty much throughout East Africa. And then after third grade, um, then they're educated in English. So they transfer to English. So, so our, our kids through most of primary school are learning or are supposed to be learning in English. Mm -hmm. What we find um, when our students start freshman year of high school at St. Al's 
is many of them know English well, but are not yet comfortable speaking it, okay? Mm -hmm. But within a, within a few weeks, they really grow in that co comfort, that confidence in speaking English. So as, as you heard from these students that were speaking, you know, our, our students certainly are fluent in English. All of their education is in English, except um, Swahili is a required subject for all four years of high school. And incidentally, um, French being such an important um, language on the continent of, of Africa after um, English, um, we require two years of French of all of our students, but then they would have the option for four years if they choose in French. And now, I, I brought this up mm -hmm. so that our viewers understand. In grammar school, mm -hmm. they grow up as trilingual That's students. Right. Mm -hmm. They learn three different languages, and then in high school, a fourth. Mm -hmm. You know, this uh, is quadrilingual. Mm -hmm. You know, when you know four languages, it's quadrilingual, or you can even say polyglot. Mm -hmm. If you know three languages, trilingual, two languages, bilingual, one language, you're American. That's right. <laughs> That's, That's right. an old saying. And, you know, to, for folks to understand, this is uh, a, a language uh, or a school that really is preparing for local as well as very international, international Africa, mm -hmm. international global, you know, right. perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, this, this is important to, for folks to understand as they watch the quality of what's going on and what kids are uh, everywhere in the world are capable of. Uh, that's why one of the local schools here starts with Latin mm -hmm. very early on mm -hmm. uh, in grammar school, and, um, but many, most schools don't. And that's, that's a problem, I think, for, you know, understanding language yes. is not knowing other languages. Very definitely. And it, um, I, I studied some French. I'm, I'm, I am a typical American. I'm not going to say <laughs> I've ever mastered another foreign language. Um, but I studied some Latin and Greek in high school and a little French um, later on. But um, I, I've, I found with learning Swahili, and I'm not fluent in Swahili, but with learning Swahili, language does also open you up to a new culture and a new way of thinking. Okay, exactly. because, because your language reflects the way you organize reality. And, yeah. and so, you know, there is really something exciting about, about learning a new language. So, um, you know, part of the broad liberal education, humanizing education that we're trying to do at St. Al's involves language study as a very important element. One of my favorite philosophers when we were in studies together was Maurice Merleau-Ponty. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And he has a wonderful phrase that language is a way of singing the world. Mm -hmm. There's a musical quality mm -hmm. to every language. Sure. Some a little more so than others. Sure, sure. Italian's a little more <laughs> right. musical to our ear than some languages. But, you know, this is... Um, uh, an important thing about opening up, and it's an opening up not only in your school and for your students to diverse cultures, but also the French and the English open them up to the modern world That's right. uh, in which you know, computer and other scientific mm -hmm. literature is written. Now, the students, mm -hmm. how, uh, how long has the school been in operation? Okay, so we began the school in January 2004, our school year starts in January with the long holiday being November, December. So it's so, something of the reverse here. Right, right. Being yeah, in the Southern Hemisphere. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And so you've been around for about 12 years. 13 years uh, 13 now. years We're now. finishing our 13th year. And with that, you, you've had uh, students graduate mm -hmm. uh, and go on to college. Mm -hmm. What are they doing now? Okay, well... Do um, they come back? And Sure, sure. We have a very strong... Alumni Association. Um, I could mention we have five of our graduates now working at the school. We have uh -huh. three working as teachers, one working as our lab assistant for the for the um, the science laboratories, mm -hmm. and one is our school bursar. Okay, mm -hmm. and of course, having those people back, they serve as an excellent example to our students um, mm -hmm. that they're. 
interacting with in an ongoing way mm -hmm. that say, you know, you can, you know, you can make it, you can do something good, you can really accomplish something with your lives. Um, we, have, we have people who have started community organizations um, mm -hmm. in Kibera, okay? Um, one called um, Foundation of Hope, which um, was started by one of our first graduates, and that is very much about, it started really trying to work with youth who were not going forward with their education because of poverty issues and so forth, um, to try to provide um, support for them to keep them off the street, um, soccer teams, um, but soccer teams that would always take time educating them about important social issues, even, for example, about, about HIV AIDS. Um, so those, those sorts of things. Um, another more recent couple of students started um, a community organization that's using art, both dance and drawing, painting, um, to help youth recognize their issues, live with their issues, make progress on mm -hmm. the issues of their, their being poor and living in the slum. You know, and I, I think as uh, somebody who's organizing these sports teams mm -hmm. for kids who could no longer continue on in school, mm -hmm. and he would be able to give a perspective on the effects of AIDS in his life as an orphan of AIDS. That's right. And let them know this is a real problem. Stay away from of course, the, this behavior risky that behavior. gets you, risky behavior that gets mm -hmm. you into this illness, and have a life that you can build on. It's it's a testimony of his own life, you know, to uh, helping these kids play well, but learn at the same time they're playing. Yeah, and and certainly, the, this organization is nearly ten years old now, and certainly it's it's gone on and it's grown. It's it's doing things like it's it's got secondhand computers, it's doing computer classes for for young people so that they can find some kind of jobs, even though it's not going to be jobs as university graduates. Um, so, you know, even they need to be in, introduced into modern technology through computers and that sort of thing, and that will help them move forward with their lives. So, so a, a good example of people really reaching out. We, I, I might mention, we have just actually three of our graduates in the United States, and they're all furthering their education for the sake of going back to Kenya and helping people there. One is getting a doctorate in nursing. One is getting a master's degree from NYU, a very prestigious university in public administration. And a third is doing a master's degree in, in engineering. So, um, uh, you know, so... It just, it just really speaks about doing, furthering their education even beyond the bachelor's degree in ways that are, are going to be benefit, beneficial uh, back in Kenya. Certainly someone with a doctorate in nursing would be able to train other nurses. That's right. Ten years ago, I don't think you could get a bachelor's degree in nursing. So it was all registered nurses. That was as high as you can go. And so this, this woman, when she comes back, is really going to be able to to have an impact because I, I'm, I'm confident there's virtually no Kenyan at this point who would have a doctorate in nursing yeah. for the sake She's of teaching and training, training others. So, something I was wondering that could possibly be confusing to, um, in terms of those video clips mm -hmm. was the, um, the very nice background that they saw. Yeah. Um, something that our be benefactors have done for us, they've enabled us to build a very beautiful kind of state-of-the-art permanent school, and that's what you saw in the background there. We've flat run out of time. Okay. <laughs> I'd love to go on about that, but I want folks to learn more about the beautiful school that they've been they've had built, uh, Saint Aloysius Gonzaga School for AIDS Orphans in Nairobi, Kenya, and you can go to sagnairobi.org. Sag, of course, for Saint um, uh, Aloysius Alves. Gonzaga. So sagnairobi.org. Thank you, Father Terry. Appreciate you coming here. I know you're visiting the States and being, coming to be with us and share some great work going on. 
If you join me in blessing our audience, may Almighty God bless you and keep you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we can bring you guests like Father Terry and all the other programs we do because this network is brought to you by you. Keeps in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill. Thank you, and God bless.